So thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, our conversant here today is, is James Braxton Peterson, uh, Associate Professor of English and also Director of the Africana Studies Department uh, or program, program at Lehigh University. Um, he is also a Duke 1993 Trinity uh, and from the English Department graduate. Um, so this is a return for him. Uh, he has done a lot of work over the years, uh, besides the scholarship, as a public scholar. Um, this location here, of course, is a forum for scholars in public, and, and it's really an opportunity for us to talk about what academics do beyond teaching your classes mm -hmm. and writing research. Right? How do we connect the work that we do here with the work that's happening in the public? Um, and at least amongst this generation of scholars, you know, no one's done it more effectively um, wow. than James Braxton Peterson. So you will see him once, twice, three times, maybe five times a week <laughs> Some on, weeks. on MSNBC. On a week where you get a DOJ report like, <laughs> like, like we got this week. Right. Mm, right. On, on MSNBC. Yeah. Um, you will hear him on his radio program, The mm -hmm. Remix, uh, which is produced out of WHYY, um, the Philadelphia PA. NPR affiliate, um, show called The Remix, which he produces radio program, also available on podcasts. Yep. You can download it on iTunes. Yep, iTunes. Free um, subscription. Uh, he also is a frequent contributor to The Griot, yep. which is the online magazine uh, that's affiliated with MSNBC. And of course, he's one of these quotable Negroes <laughs> <laughs> at places like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times and all these places who are looking for expertise will call and talk to you for 90 minutes and two, then quote two, two sentences right. of that, of that conversation. Right. Right. And you have to feel good about the fact that you think that you helped shape the article yes. 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 in the way yes. that. Yes. And, and so, you know, I wanted to bring him here, at least in this instance, and talk about this idea of what a black public intellectual is. Um, mm. And it's a term that has come up most recently, really from the time that you graduated from Duke. That's right. With the emergence of a generation of black scholars, um, folks like Cornel West, yeah. the late Van Ingrabble, yeah. Bell Hooks, yeah. uh, Mike Eric Dyson, you know, who we both know very well. Yeah. Um, and it was a new moment, really, for black studies. Black studies, which in many ways, African American studies, had been in uh, underground, <laughs> for lack of <laughs> yes. a better way to describe yes. it. You know, suddenly you're seeing black scholars prominently featured on shows like Nightline, mm -hmm. uh, the Charlie Rose Show, mm -hmm. the Today Show, yeah. and, and, and at least for the generation of us that were in grad school at the time, or even undergrad in your case, and, and you know, for those of you in the class, you, you will see uh, an interesting clip um, of, of Dr. Peterson <laughs> at the beginning of his lecture oh, today, wow. his first foray oh, into public intellectual activity. Can't wait to see that. But for many of us who were in grad school um, or thinking about grad school, these folks were rock stars. Yeah, to us. So um, there was no other way to describe it. You know, these were folks who looked like us who lose, use language that was familiar to us, right. that talked about things that we knew, That's right. that you know, we only would see like on the far reaches of a PBS station, <laughs> you know, someplace right. 11 o'clock at night. That's right. um, so for you, James, you know, looking at the terrain, you know, when you first see folks like Bell Hooks right. and Cornell West, I mean, Cornell West was really the, the, the initial big star yeah. of that generation. Yeah. When, when you first see somebody like Cornell West, I mean, what do you think? Well, well, so, I mean, I got to go back a little bit further than that because for, for me, it kind of started here for me. I was, I, I was a senior here. Um, this is the same year I did that 60 Minutes thing, but I took a course with Carla, Carla Holloway. Um, Dr. Holloway was brand new at Duke. She had just come over from NC State. Um, and in fact, I had been accepted at NC State for a master's program, and so I, I was really excited about taking her class. And it was a class on black literary theory. And she introduced us to black literary theory by having us read a, a series of essays uh, in the Journal of, of American Literature, or Journal of American History, something like that, American Literary History, which, which featured uh, this really like mean-spirited intellectual debate between Houston Baker and Skip Gates on and one Joyce, side and Joyce and, and, Joyce. Joyce, and Joyce on the other. And you know, I'm from North New Jersey. I'm like hip hop head. Dude, I I couldn't conceive that scholars could diss each other in that way in print. I mean, they came so hard at each other, 
You know what I mean? Like it was getting personal. They were signifying all this stuff. And I was I had never read anything like that. And and to be honest with you, it scared me. Like I was scared. I was like, damn, I don't know if I want to enter into this shit. This is like real, you know. It was it seemed it, I don't and when I read it now, I'm like, hmm, this is you know it, it's funny because you know when when Cornell West and Melissa Harris Perry had their <laughs> their thing went down a few years ago. Um, I remember talking to Davy D. Yeah. And David D was like, why do scholars acting like they hip hop heads? And I'm like, yes. and I was like, no, Davey, if you actually read some of these journal pieces yeah, where folks are responding, right? it's like, this yes. stuff is, is pretty intense, right? Yes. It's, it's you know. It was, so it's, what's interesting to me about that is that my framing of the black public intellectual was not about black scholars speaking to a public necessarily. It was more about black scholars airing their dirty laundry, dirty laundry and their conflict publicly and that. It was very intimidating. It so, was very so, intimidating. So to put this in some sort of context for those of you, you know, who aren't familiar with these names, you know, Henry Louis Gates is probably the, the most recognizable and most permanent, preeminent black uh, African American intellectual in yes. the world. Who had just left Duke. He had just, just left, left Duke. Just left, just left yeah. Duke to, to, to run, you know, Harvard's black studies program. Right. Houston Baker, who's a little older than, than Henry Louis Gates, uh, really is that first significant generation of African-American scholars yeah. that, you know, comes into the white academy in the late 60s and the early yeah. 1970s. You know, so they got their own issues. They have their, they have issues. Right. Their beef is crazy. <laughs> they, they, they got their own issues yes. over, you know, in, in some ways I think Houston always felt that, that Skip Gates was nipping at his heels. Yes. All right. And, and yes. of course, Skip has this profile. And then Joyce, and Joyce, you know, who's also a feminist scholar, but yeah. also coming from a very Afrocentric point yeah. of view. Yeah. And so when you read this stuff, you, the gender dynamic of it it's crazy. is so profound, right? Yeah. What you have are two very well-known senior male, black male scholars yeah. essentially beating down yeah. on a black woman scholar who yeah. does not have their kind of prominence. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and it also, it presented to me the real first challenge, because I'm really thinking about grad school and what I'm gonna do at this point in time. Um, it presented the first conflict of interest for me in becoming a scholar, which was, Joyce and Joyce was arguing that the language and the discourse of the theories um, that Henry Louis Gates and Houston Baker were using was not accessible. So she was making an argument that the languages around uh, postmodernism and uh, post-structuralism, these very deep theoretical and philosophical um, uh, philosophically dense um, academic languages were not accessible to the people that we needed to be speaking to. She, she was making an argument about public intellectualism. She was making an argument that academics have a responsibility to reach a certain public, particularly for me as a kid who came from Newark, New Jersey, I'm, I'm already at Duke realizing that the awesome opportunity, you guys have an awesome opportunity to study at a place like this. And I know you don't think about it like on a day-to-day -day basis is because you're here and it's just, it's Duke and you kind of, you, it just becomes part of your life. But the reality is you're at one of the most elite institutions in the world, by far and period. And so I was confronted with that um, at this particular point in time. And so while I was learning so much from Dr. Baker and from Dr. Gates, Dr. Gates was like the model in terms of literary scholars doing public work. Um, uh, I, I really sympathized with Joyce and Joyce's point, which was, you know, it's great to talk and know all of these theories and all these ideologies and the philosophies and all that stuff is fantastic, but what about the folks who, 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 who don't necessarily have access to that? And part of what undergirded even this moment of black public intellectuals, right, is this longer history of, of black studies, yep. right? Black studies, unlike I would argue any other discipline in the academy, mm -hmm. with the exception of maybe ethnic studies mm -hmm. and women's studies, was a discipline that was essentially brought into the academy to respond to outside social That's right. demands. That's right. It's a good part because yeah, not a protest. Period. Just like, yeah, right. right. And, and there's no, you know, sociology wasn't brought. No. into the academy no. right, no. because no. sociologists were protesting. That's right. No. They wanted to no. know. Black studies <laughs> comes from the streets, period. You can't deny that history. You can't. Um, it, there were people who were protesting in the streets, literally, um, and young people on college campuses who demanded better representation across the disciplines, better representation in the faculty, all that stuff. I mean, your history here at Duke, I mean, that's, that's what the Allen Building takeover was all, all about. about. 
Now you go up north to Cornell with James Turner and those folks, yeah. they have their own version of the Allen story, except they were like shotguns. Guns. Yes. <laughs> right. Students with guns taking over university. Can you imagine mm -hmm. students arming themselves and taking over a building on campus? That seems <laughs> far fetched in the 21st century. But but that's the reality of the history of black studies and that debate aired in an academic public, present, it scared the mess out of me, but also presented me with that initial challenge, which is, can you do this work at a high level um, and still be connected to the community? So what's about? been your criteria for that, right? For me, I, I, I always said I didn't want to, and, and you know, this is part of the pressure, right? We, we write and talk a certain kind of way because you know we're in a space where our white colleagues very often don't think that we're capable Doing rigorous work. That's right. of writing that's right. and talking that's a certain kind. That's right. I, I mean that's that's the reality. That's the reality. Right. Right. Yes. right. The reality. Or publishers, is, editors, right. you know, deans, you know. If you could imagine being the six foot ten African American male student who's a chemist, right. But when they see that person walking across the yard. They never think that they're chemists, right? right? They're obviously here to play basketball, right? Too. You know, that same process That's plays right. out for black academics. <laughs> yes, right. That's like the everyday. And, like but, you know, for me, for that criteria, it's always been, you know, can I talk about something and write about something in a way that my father would have understood? Yes. Right? My father dropped out of school in 10th grade. Yes. Right? Can I yes. talk about it in a way that speaks to what it needs to speak to yes. in this space? But also, and I don't want to say translate because translate is suggesting yeah, yeah, right, yeah. that it's a different language right. and it's something less than. Right. But to have the flexibility to be able to talk to this particular audience, yes. but also talk to you know folks like my dad, yes. you know, yes. and have them find some value in what I was doing. Yeah. So, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Mark Anthony has been a great mentor of mine, and in your work, you do that very successfully. Um, what the music says, especially, but in all your work, you do that very successfully, which is to say that you walk a line of uh, producing very sophisticated academic work that is also accessible. Um, if you read my writing, I haven't been as <coughs> successful at doing that because I've, I've erred on the side of writing traditionally within sort of academic discourses. Um, but I think criteria for me, there, there were a couple of things. One, I had to have subject matter that mattered. Um, I needed to be writing about, thinking about, teaching about. It couldn't be esoteric. Right. It couldn't, it couldn't be esoteric. Esoteric. It could be esoteric. Not for me. No disrespect to people who study like, you know, medieval poetry, or no disrespect to people who study like primary documents from the fifth century or whatever the hell people do. <laughs> like no disrespect to them whatsoever. Uh, but for me, uh, that was my first criteria. You were an outstanding model for that because you were writing about things that were less tangible, like soul aesthetic, post-soul aesthetics, and like talking about good times, and R. Kelly, and I was, you know, like, and I'm in grad school at this point in time, and I'm just like, you know, I don't, you know, the challenge as an academic is, for me, is I've had models who I will never be able to be like. Like, I will never be Skip Gates, I'll never be Michael Price, and I'll never be Mark Anthony Neal. And so you have to figure out, like, what you can borrow from them that's useful to you, and, uh, and then you can kind of uh, riff off from there. So I, I realized from you that I could actually write about hip hop in a way that was satisfying to me. Um, and even though I don't think I've reached that mark of, ex of accessibility in my writing, what I've done is I've tried to find other outlets to connect with students and to connect with the community around hip hop culture and hip hop music. Let's talk about one of our good friends. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about Cornell. Yes. And, and Cornell. You know, Cornell, Cornell story that nobody really knows. I worked for Cornell West and Michael Eric Dyson at the same time. I think I'm the only person who can actually say that. I TA'd for both of them at the same time. When, when Dyson was at Penn and West was at Princeton. Was at Princeton. <laughs> Things were better between them at that right, point right, in time. Right, right, right. Uh, but I think I'm the only person who actually worked for both of those guys at the same time. Cornell represented something that was very, I think, recognizable for the mainstream because yes. even though he wasn't ordained, he was preacherly. That's right. Right, right, so when folks saw Cornell with the afro and the blue yep. piece suit and yep. that, right, it, it was something that was recognizable. You know, Mike was something else, right? Mike, yeah. Mike talked too fast. Yeah, used um, big words all the time. Used big words all the time. Um, seemed to be hungry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In a way, you know, Cornell came into the space, and I'm uh, Cornell West into the space. Yes. Mike was very, I won't say aggressive, but very hungry yes. about creating access to that space. Yes. You know, in the context of his career, you know, I got 13 or 14 books, right? You know, pumping out a book a year. Yeah. And, but the critique that you get mm -hmm. of Mike mm -hmm. 
Very often for people who never read his book. Right. <laughs> Here we go. Like the running joke. Here we go. Right. And, and, and for you to understand James's relationship to Michael Eric Dyson, the best way to describe James is that James is Michael's consigliere. Yes. That, yes. That's, that's his role. That's a good. That's right. Yes. That's his role. Right. Yes. You want to get to Mike, you got to go through. You got to go through James first. Um, but you know, there are folks. The critique is that folks who do public intellectual work, right, are watering down. Right, right. The, the intellectual content, right? right. That right. that because you show up on TV and you got those four or five rhymes that you love, right? <laughs> That's right. And he was you, with those rhymes. You got those four or five rhymes. In That's it, right. Right. That That's somehow right. the That's fact right. that he has a capacity orally to uh, to try to at least bring the narratives of hip hop into this different kind of space. Yes. That somehow he's not doing rigorous work. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, this is, I, I'm a little bit resistant to the whole public intellectual tag right, so or, you know, for, I, don't, I don't think it fits me so, necessarily. So, so let me ask you this question yeah, as yeah. you go into your answer. Would yeah. you rather be identified as a public intellectual yeah. Yeah. or a hip-hop intellectual? Yeah, neither one. Neither, neither, one, of those, neither <laughs> one of those, actually. Um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> Harold Cruz has a classic uh, work in black studies called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Uh, which lays out a lot of these issues, the challenges, and what what some of the sacrifices or concessions you have to make in that public space as an intellectual, uh, but also um, uh, what the nature of black scholarship can be, right? Um, and so you take someone like Dyson, um, and I, I think that the people who read his work understand that there's quite a bit of rigor in the work that he people does. Who read the work, right? People who read the work, um, uh, I think people confuse his public persona with his sort of academic mission all the time. Um, uh, what you have to understand about someone like Dyson is he's a rhetorical master. So if you can imagine someone who can master any rhetorical situation, you put him on TV, he's a master. You put him in the pulpit, he's a master. You put him at a podium, a master. You put him in front of a classroom, a master. That level of mastery is... You know, that day when the Tupac book came out, and he started the day, it wasn't Tupac, actually it was the Cosby book. Cosby book. Started the day on the Today Show. Yep. Middle of the day, he's on Rap City. Yep. Right. Ended up on Bill Maher. That evening, he's on Bill Maher. Yeah. Right. You yeah. can't think of yeah. anybody. Yeah. Intellectual or not, no. right? That, no. that, that can function in all those very different kinds yeah. of platforms. Yeah. And pre preaching in church on Sunday, uh, volunteering uh, at the prison on Saturday, and every single audience that he touches, he inspires, he moves. He, you know what I mean? So, I feel like. <coughs> We could let's if people will ever want to talk about a scholarship, which people never do, but they want to talk about a scholarship. Let's we should, we can talk about it. I mean, it's, it's cultural studies scholarship, it's religious studies scholarship. He's got some great stuff. You could argue that maybe some of his earlier books are a little bit more academic than his later books, but the guy is on number seventeen or eighteen at this point in time. You know, we probably shouldn't be arguing about his scholarly bona fides. Uh, he's published a lot. He's written a lot. Um, you can maybe not like his style, but what I just try to tell people is he's a, he's a master. So. You have to respect that. Um, I can't preach a sermon. He's preaches sermons in church every Sunday. He teaches at Georgetown. Preaches sermons every, every Sunday. Has, has, taught, has taught at Georgetown. Has taught at DePaul. Has taught Penn. at Penn. You know what I mean? Come has on, this guy. At Brown. Look, let me. I'll tell you one great story that I love to talk about. Dyson. So this guy goes in for his uh, uh, for to get his his dissertation proposal accepted. It's a <laughs> it's a, a meeting he has with uh, Cornell West, Rabito, and uh, uh, the Giants. In religious studies. In religious studies at Princeton. All right. They sit down for a couple hours. Um, they're going back and forth about the proposal, you know, debating it, going over, tweaking it, you know. And at the end of that, the committee says, you know, we accept the proposal. This is, we accept your dissertation proposal. You know, you can now start the process. Reaches into his bag, takes out the dissertation, <laughs> puts it on his head. Right. Like that's. <laughs> And that still hasn't been published. Right, right. Right. That, right. that, that hasn't been published. Hasn't been published. And so when and again, I think you know, he and Dyson is a good model of what a public intellectual can be in the ways in which people think about public intellectualism, because this is a guy whose work publicly has always outstripped his work in the academy. Um, that's not the case for me right now. Um, you know, I do a lot of public work, but I still do a lot of administrative work, a lot of teaching, a lot of work in the academy. You know, he skipped a assistant associate. He kind of, kind of came out and had a job, and then moved straight to full professor. I mean, he has an incredible uh, uh, a story, and I think he, he he's he's a good model of what of what a black public intellectual. Uh, I mean, in the whole background. I mean, welfare dad, welfare dad, dad started college late. Started college in twenty one. Right. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, that, I, I don't have that story. Let's talk about this Obama moment, right? Because one of the, the ripples of, you know, now year seven yeah. or year six of Obama yeah. um, is that it changed the media landscape, right? Oh, you know, Melissa, Melissa Harris Perry doesn't necessarily have a show on MSNBC, you know, without the impact of, of, of Obama, oh, sure. right? You know, Jory Reid, for the time that she had a show, she yes. doesn't have a show. Less than a year. You know, every Negro that shows up on them is in BC. Yes. Right? Me included. Right. Me included. Yeah. Reverend Sharpton. I mean, yes. none of those folks are in the room without. That's right. That's how right. do, how does the body, right? Yeah. Black intellectuals, black pundits, what have you, how does that get sustained? Post Obama, right? And we're starting to see that now. Right. Right. You know, Joy's lost her show, right. right? I mean, how, how right. does that get sustained now that there's no longer this interest? Right. Right. You know, so like having Negroes comment on the Negro. Who's right. 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 I mean, man, if you, I, and I don't want to sound too pessimistic here, but I got to tell you that the Obama presidency has exposed fault lines uh, in the black community that I, I didn't know existed. Uh, and, and honestly, I did, just didn't fully appreciate, um, you know, and what it is, and it's not sustainable, right? Because right. what Obama represents, and there are great scholars who've done great work on this, Imani Perry being one of them, just to talk about the challenges of black exceptionalism and what that means in terms of our capacity to understand the challenges of the black community, right? Um, but the narratives of exceptionalism are what drove that interest, Obama being exceptional, um, Melissa Harris Perry is exceptional, but she still is a part of that kind of narr narrativity. Um, and it's not sustainable because, you know, in the post Obama era, um, there's going to have to be a lot of healing, I think, within the black community about some of those fault lines that have been exposed. I mean, I have never, and, and again, I'm a guy who talks about progressive things on a progressive network. Um, and so I get a lot of right-wing negativity directed at me, a lot of go back to Africa, a lot of racist slurs. That's any, you spend a minute on TV. It, it, it's amazing how uncreative <laughs> oh my God. a lot of that stuff oh is. Sometimes I post stuff on Facebook, you know, like, so, you know, somebody called me liberal lips once before. Like, it's it's, it's, all it's all like the, so 1930s. It's 1930s. They just pull all of the stock terms from like a bygone era of racism and they throw them at me. So you, you get used to that. but. Over the course of the Obama administration, critiques have been coming to me more and more from the left, from the black left, right? Um, and, and basically, I've been critical of the president, but from the perspective of a lot of progressives, not critical enough. enough. Right. Um, and, and while those attacks usually, not always, those attacks usually are um, uh, a little bit more sensible, they're still quite uh, intense. Um, and I think uh, that's just a microcosm of what's been going on all over black America. Now, you throw the Obama bots in there, which is a large group of people on social media. If you say anything bad about Obama, they will come after you hard. I get those guys all the time. It's funny, you get, so you get the right wing folks saying you're crazy, you go back to Africa and stuff. You get left folks to the left of the president. With some critiques that are legitimate. Right. With right. some critiques that are legitimate. Right. And then you get the Obama bots where if I even say like, you know, man, this drone strikes thing is really messed up. I say it on TV, we're like, we should just be using drones for non-lethal missions. Mm -hmm. You get the Obama bots will just be jump all over you. You sell out, you this, you that, you know what I mean? And so I think, I think that is, those are some of the unseen consequences of the emergence of a sort of elite um, black media punditry in an Obama moment where you get those factions who will never agree uh, with, with what some of the things you're saying in, in the public sphere. Do you think the Obama presidency had sidetracked a black political project? No, I think on the contrary, this is actually, I'm not going to be a little bit positive. I think because of that fragmentation in the community and because I think it forces us all to think about um, the sort of sense of tribalism within the black community and coming to terms with the fact that we are not monolithic, um, will ultimately produce some great outcomes. I think it'll produce great outcomes in media, ultimately. Uh, I think it'll produce great outcomes in writing in the public sphere, ultimately, because if you look at the platforms like Color Lines, Racial Assist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the different online publishing platforms for black spaces, that's a great space to think about uh, where we've made some good progress. The work that Brittany Cooper's doing. Oh, so man, great. if you're not reading Brittany Cooper, you are not reading the smartest black woman writing publicly on a weekly basis. She is absolutely outstanding. 
Um, and so I think the emergence of that um, is, is one, I think that that's a positive to come out of that fragmentation and all that nastiness and, and, and negativity that an Obama presidency presents to the black community. You know, you mentioned that your time is, is you know, there's more demands in your time when there's something going on yeah. that deals yeah. with black folks. Yeah. Um, and we see all the time, and I think about uh, the legal job, the guy, Jeffrey um, Tobin. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. Tobin, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tobin, mm -hmm. you know, who gets to talk about everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe a, a quarter of it is actually in his lane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you will rarely see black Mm -hmm. Public intellectuals allowed mm -hmm. to comment on things outside of black subject. Right. That's right. The the one person I think about that's outside of that is you know another one of our boys, um, Mark Lamont Hill. Yes. The the work that he did at Fox. Yep. And now the work he's doing at CNN. Yep. He's one of the rare rare black voices that you get to hear. That's right. In fact, you you could almost argue he comments more on stuff outside that's of right. the black experience. That's exactly thing. right. Um, what is the frustration associated with that? Yeah, well, for, I mean, shout out to Mark Lamont Hill because w what he crafted for himself in the public sphere, and he worked very hard at that, um, is a fairly unique sort he of created, He created platforms that no one... You know, That's exactly right. I, I, That's I, exactly I, right. I, I still joke with him when he did when he first started doing blog posts. Yep. And I was like, what the hell is this? Yep. Right. Yep. But he had he he understood the lane he could live and breathe, and he's another guy with a lot of smarts in pop culture stuff. Mm -hmm. And people don't know this, but when he was on that Fox stuff, he was also doing a lot of like HLN and entertainment today. He was doing a lot of pop culture stuff, which positioned him in a certain way. Um, and now he works with BET, CNN, and Huffington Post. He's got he's on cross platforms. But but I think if you talk to him, he'll tell you that that his focus on the public has had its consequences in terms of his progress in the academy and what. He's been doing. I mean, if you hear someone who writes a who co-writes a book with Mumia Abu Jamal, right? Right. I mean, that's you know, you could have been the most seasoned, yeah, veteran professor, and, and that would have been there would have been push Some problems around that kind of project, yeah, right? yeah. But I think for Mark, uh, he's more interested in the public piece of it, um, and that's that's I think that's fantastic. You know, for me, I, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough at MSNBC to have certain producers and certain hosts want me to come on and talk about other things. So, so you know, I, I, at least once a week, I'm on Jose Diaz Ballard and I'm talking about just straight politics, right? Um, some of the more evening shows are a little bit more um, uh, personality shows, and so yes, they want me on to talk about racial things. By the way, this is a difficult thing to say, but but I don't sort of, while I critique the burden of representation, um, I ultimately have learned that I have to embrace it, right? Because what happens is, is you know, like I remember I was, I was so mad when Charles Barkley said he wasn't a role model. You, know, you guys are probably really young when this happened. That was like they really. Were bored when that happened. <laughs> I, I was infuriated by that, right? Because in work, I work with young people all the time in public schools, in prison systems. And if you know how young people's minds work, especially like inner city young folks, uh, young people of color, poor young people, um, you know that Charles Barkley doesn't have an option as to whether or not he wants to be a role model. And I can't remember, you know, most of my time, even in a place like Duke, you're one of a, one or two, maybe one black student in a class, and a lot of times you're asked to represent 13 million people. And, I used to reject that outright, bro. I really did, I really did. But I, I've had to come to terms with it because, number one, I want to challenge myself to critique those kinds of questions when they come, but also try to be representative. Because if I reject the burden of representation with everything that's been afforded to me, then I'm actually saying that it's okay for the Jeffrey Tubins of the world to speak on whatever issues they're gonna speak on. Because the reality is, the, the world that I live in, there's only a few people that get into the lane of being on TV. By whatever reason, I still can't tell you how I got there. Right? However you get there, it is an elite space, just like you guys. There's you know, one percent of the one percent go to Duke, right? Think about people on TV, this is a very small group. If I reject speaking about race, um, I'm actually, I think, abnegating part of my responsibility and honestly disrespecting people like yourself and Michael Eric Dyson, Cornel West, Skip Gates, all the people who, Carla Holloway, all the people who invested in me as a scholar that challenged me to be able to speak eloquently, I'm rejecting all of that work. And so what I try to do is do my homework. 
You know, try to do my homework and try to be humble. Um, um, but but the burden of representation, and that's that's what's always going to be complicated when you talk about things on TV. What do black public intellectual platforms look like outside of corporate context? I'm gonna, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you. I'll show you my latest project. Yes, yeah, see, yeah. This is what it looks like, right? Um, so I so one, and let me be clear here. Uh, there isn't really anything outside of corporate context, uh, not in the United States. But there are things that are more resistant. Because even Twitter's corporate. Even Twitter is corporate. Right? Even Twitter is corporate. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you know the. I, we're all capitalists in some ways, I guess. Um, but I'm always trying to be sensible and sensitive to market forces. Uh, and so my first book uh, came out in September. Palgrave Macmillan is charging $90 a copy for it. Uh, my second book came out in December, and uh, Bucknell University Press is charging $125 per copy. Now, in the, wor in the world of academic publishing and in college campuses where people buy books that cost that much, that's I I I, I'm, I hate that market model, but I you know we, we live by it. I mean we can we can assign ninety ninety dollar books to students, and because it's the cost of being here, they yeah. will buy it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Cat in the corner. That's a different conversation. Different conversation. And and the question for me is, well, what do you, what do you do about it? You know, how do you, you gotta make something? You have to do something. You know, and and I I feel like all along in my career I've been trying to find. Uh, some kind of answer to that, and uh, this is one answer to it. I just recorded some speeches, took some interview clips, found a hot hip hop producer, and put this together. Um, and it's ten bucks. All right, and you can download it for like eight bucks. You know, and and I, I from honestly, iTunes, from iTunes or Amazon or wherever it's everywhere now. It came out yesterday, and so for me, that that and the remix, which is my podcast, which is free and which is weekly and which is put out by an NPR affiliate, goes to the community. I mean, again, I don't want to call myself a public intellectual, but the public work that I do is really about me trying to 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 get some of that content out to a broader public. If you don't call yourself a, black, a public intellectual, what do you consider yourself? I mean, I'm a scholar of hip-hop culture. I don't mind calling myself a, a scholar in any way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the way I parse scholar versus intellectual is that um, you know, a scholar, and I have this quote, I don't even remember my own quote, but, but basically, you know, scholars have to teach, they have to write, and they have to be activists. I um, mean, good scholars do all those things. Um, and so I, I, I try to write as much as possible for the public and for the 12 people who are going to read my book. Um, uh, I try to teach courses that make sense to students in the 21st century, that challenge them to think critically about issues around race and gender and intersectionality. Um, and and I'm you know last week I spoke after Pam Africa at the uh, at the at the rally around uh, Jer Jerome uh, Reed who was shot by police in Richardson, uh, uh, New Jersey. So to me, all those things have to be yeah. happening uh, in order for it to work. And then ultimately, if you're creating products, if you're writing books, um, and your books are as expensive as mine are, then you've got to have alternatives to that uh, for people. I, I can tell you that when I was in grad school, my you know, parents were like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? You graduated from Duke and you're going back to school? Like, my, my parents could not conceptualize that you would graduate from a place like this and not just be rich and go work somewhere. They did. You know, and, and you guys know this is real. Parents, the parental pressure when you go to a school like this is intense. And rightfully so, but it's also like limited in scope of like what you can do to be and, successful. And I would argue actually the pressure doesn't come from parents who themselves Went to elite school. That's right. But the, the pre more pressure is actually from parents who didn't go to that's school. That's right. Right. That's right. Because you know they did whatever they did. They did so whatever you did. could go to. That's school. right. That's right. That's right. And so that I, I have felt that pressure all along. I can remember when I'm dissertating. I'm struggling with my desk and uh, talking to my mom on the phone. Because my parents literally didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was in school for ten years after college. <laughs> so I, I'm talking to my mom on the phone. Uh, she's like, "When are you going to law school?" I'm like, I'm like ABD, dude. Like, I'm like, well, it's the PhD. When am I going to law school? What are you talking about? But I can also remember my parents' responses the first time they saw me on TV. And, and whether they got it or not, they were like, yo, we get it now. And we understand, you know, that, that, you know, that translated this way. And that may sound like simple and like uh, shallow. My parents are not shallow people, but 
But the reality is the challenge for me as in terms of this whole public intellectual piece is am I doing things, saying things, speaking things, writing things in the public that my family uh, uh, is doing? My family is not like, you know, I come from, you know, working class to middle class, black family out of Newark, New Jersey. All of my siblings are educated, but, but you know, and they all bought the hip hop underground. I don't know how many have read it, you know, but every single member of my family will listen to this. And so that's for me. Yeah, that's that's one of the challenges. You know, my, my favorite left the black story. Um, Cornell came out a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, Cornell. Was I got, we, got a, I we, got, we got a two-hour long Cornell. Oh, that's right. I did see that. That's right. a season finale. So that's he like came, season finale. came yeah, down yeah, yeah, to yeah, a yeah. church in Raleigh, yeah. and, and they allowed us to come in and shoot this conversation. Wow. And um, I'm at a KFC. I don't fuck too much with KFC anymore. <laughs> but, but I'm at a KFC, you know. My kids call it KFP for <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my stuff wasn't ready, right? So I had to right. go pull over to the side for them to bring out some fresh hot, you know, yes. fried chicken. Yeah. Dude comes out and he's like, yo, I saw you on, on that show. Yeah. Left, you that dude from Left of Life yeah. Cornell West. And it was yes. like, that's like my job is done. Right? Yes. That's, that's more important than any other shit. Right? Listen, look, you, 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 if you, you know, I, that's what it is about to me. Like, again, I'm going to do what I need to do to get to full professor and do what I'm supposed to do in the academy. But what it's about for me ultimately is not, not public recognition as much as public connection. Yeah. Right, that the public's fancy to do. If you if you look up the uh, conversation between myself, Nas, and Dyson at Georgetown on YouTube, it's like a hundred thousand hits. Right, right. hundred thousand. That, that's hits. the running joke here at Duke. You know, as Duke is archiving all this stuff on, on video. If you go to the Duke YouTube site, yeah. the most popular video on the Duke YouTube site yeah. is me, you, and Knife Wonder talking about Illmatic. I mean that you know you can't you can't argue with that and, and you say that to folks and they're like what are you talking what about? are you talking about? who's not <laughs> you're like okay all right. Or, all right or or after we did that and this is what five years ago right? yes like, like the five yes. Year anniversary yes. of that right the, the dude who writes sends the email I was on the fence about whether or not to come to Duke right but then I saw this shit and I was like oh no I'm going to Duke that's right, right. now here's the dirty little secret about all of this right which is to say in the academy they look down their noses at this kind of public or popular work right Absolutely. but the reality is what draws people to Duke is like basketball team and that kind of stuff yeah. that's what it is right and so and 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 listen you know one of the reasons why I've been successful at Lehigh is because there are a lot of people who did not know that where Lehigh was or what it was, <laughs> so they saw it on a TV screen. All right. And, and, and you know, had Angela Davis? Angela Davis, Nas, you know, Dyson, have you soon, um, you know, Michelle Alexander, you know, we've done some great programs. Did this incredible <laughs> Malcolm X conference. Malcolm X conference, that was amazing. We live streamed it. We had Tariq Ali, uh, Pat and Daye, like just different people who knew Malcolm X, uh, who worked in the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Rose Clemente was there. Um, and, and I think that kind of programming, relevance to young people, relevance to social justice issues, um, there, there is a way in which the, what is considered the popular and the public sphere is very important to the future of institutions of higher learning. Very, very important. It's very important for institutions that are concerned about um, the melt of student bodies as a result of you know, pop-up universities and online learning. You know, one way that we make bricks and mortar have meaning is the programming that we do here and the professors that are here that you want to touch hands with. And so I feel like there's a, you know, that's why the market for black public intellectuals in the academy is, is a thriving. <coughs> We're going to open this up to questions now, if you have any. Well, since you're all, you're both there. Yes, ma'am. We are here. That and I'm from Detroit. That is Karen Jean Hunt, <laughs> who is our department's embedded librarian. Who well, I like that. So she's, can embed I get she's embedded in our classes. Yeah, I need to get one of those. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I can travel. This is good. I can go back more. Um, what are we going to do about Gil Scott Heron? So that people do not forget. She's trying to get here. She's trying to get Gil's papers. Now, yeah. Dennis is, you know, the little that they have after the house was robbed and, yeah. and, and, and all of that. But I'm just afraid that if we keep going like this, there are going to be more and more people who have no idea. idea. But, but, you know, Karen, to your point, 
it's also a critical one about what we have to do with these institutions, right? Because these institutions have the resources. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right? Particularly places like this, right? You know, everybody was upset at Toni Morrison because she decided to keep her papers at Princeton instead of, instead of giving them to Howard. Yeah. Some institutions just simply don't have the infrastructure, right, to, to be able to, yeah. to caretake this, <laughs> right? We know these places do, right? So, yeah. you know, Africa Van Bader's papers yeah, are going to be at Cornell yeah. next to the Gettysburg Address. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so that's a big deal. Right? It is a big deal. But yeah. how do we look at folks like Gill? Mm -hmm. um, how do, we were talking <laughs> earlier about this guy, James Spady. Yeah. You know, James Spady is the only organic Gramscian intellectual that anybody in, in like in the hood ever, has ever seen. That's right? right. This is a dude who's an independent scholar who always has a bag of books. Yep. Who shows up at academic conferences but does not have any academic affiliation. That's right has written like five or six oh books, right? Tones. The, the kind of shit that like you gotta buy on a corner. That's right. <laughs> from That's some dude selling right. pamphlets. That's right. You know, how does his stuff, right? Who, who's, you know, who's collecting James so, Spady's So, so for Spady, um, Samir Magelli and people like myself who love Spady, I hope will have access uh, to his papers when that time comes. That's a Herculean effort to do his work. And my suggestion for Gil Scott Heron is you've got to identify the scholars who are deeply invested in his work. Scholars like me, by the way, I got a great snippet of an interview with Gil Scott Heron in the Hip Hop Underground and African American Culture. And what's sad is that I lost the longer version of that interview, but I, I may be able to recover it. But there is a group of scholars who are deeply interested in the legacy of Gil Scott Heron. Now, now you rally those folk around, like so for example, I can host a Gil Scott Heron conference at Lehigh, we can pull a lot of those people out, get them all in one space, and I would love to do that, by the way. Um, and so there's ways, you know what I mean, I'm just saying, there are ways to do that. But here's, here's the deal. So we could do that, right? Um, but there always has to be a person who can be a liaison between those academics and the family and the people who control the estate. Um, and so one of the reasons why Tupac's papers were able to be collected and they're right next to MLK stuff, at least the MLK stuff that Clark uh, Atlanta has, um, is because there are a lot of scholars who love Tupac, me included, um, but there were, there, were, there were people who could function as liaisons between the family and the people who control the estate. Tupac's estate is one of the most meticulously managed and controlled estates in the world, right? Um, uh, but there, and and it, has, it has by no means been easy. But we have had access, and there's great people who function as go-betweens between Afeni Shakur and the other, and, and, and Gloria Cox, who we call on Glow, uh, who really control what their army of lawyers control what the estate is, um, and they've allowed scholars in. And I don't, I don't know Gil Scott Heron's family, and I don't know all the different copyright holders of his work. Right, That's right, another right. thing. Um, but there's got to be someone, maybe like yourself, who's a liaison between the family members or like the people directly connected to the estate and the scholars who are eager, we're chomping at the bit. You know, if I put out a call for papers for a Gil Scott Heron conference, it's, it's going to be populated immediately. But, but, you know, that's one part of the battle, right? You know, two box at Clark. Yeah. Atlanta, but that makes sense, right? Yes. You know, how, how do you convince a place like Duke, right, that... Gil Scott Heron, right? And this is this is the irony, right? So much of what's in these archives yeah. is some scholar's pet project. Right. Yep. <laughs> who decided that this person that's important, yeah. who only becomes important because their stuff is archived. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, but you know, no one's going to be sitting like Gil Scott Heron. Who's that? Exactly. 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 And again, you, it, the, it, the place doesn't matter. There's so many people's papers who are places that are disconnected from what their legacies are. Um, but I, we should talk more about this. I, I could talk a long time about this because, you know, one of the challenges with archiving Gil Scott Heron is that he sold the rights to a lot of his stuff. And so even if you go to the estate, uh, there still has to be a process of going to all the copyright holders. You know, the Revolution Will Not Be Televised is not owned by the Gil Scott Heron estate. Um, he had to sell it. He sold it for whatever reasons. And so, Getting that all together is going to be a Herculean process, and getting it outside of places where he lived or where he had personal affection for when he was younger is, is a difficult thing to do. That's another important part, right? Because what you're really talking about, and we've watched this with George Clinton and yeah. a few other folks, you know, artists, creative artists who have had to sell off the rights yeah. to their work in it's order right. to eat yeah. right, and, and have a place to live. Um, we see other models yeah. of 
poets, filmmakers, visual artists that get claimed by these institutions. Yeah. Um, and so Gil was someone who 20 years ago yeah. right, should have been claimed you yes. know, by an institution that yes. way. Yes. Cornell, thankfully, is is doing that kind of work around Van Vonen. Yeah. When you think about some of the hip hop artists who've come through in the last 15 or 20 years, I mean, who would be the folks that you think that you know we really need to think about creating some sort of institutional space, right, to allow them to continue to be creative, right, but not have to be creative in a way in which they have to sell off their legacy, right, and do all kinds of you know it's. It's step and fetch it, right? It's Lincoln right. Perry. Yeah. You know, after he had given it, everybody hates step and fetch it, right? right? Because of right. what his representation right. was. Right. But no one's paying attention to the fact that, that Lincoln Perry is writing checks to the NWC yep. every year, right? Yep. I mean, he's sustaining a political yep. project yep. Yep. by being a coon on film, right? Yep. And it's in 1930, so, you know, he didn't have any options, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. not like it's 2015 mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you don't have to be a coon. Right. Well, that's the debate. <laughs> But you know, when that system is gone and he's right. no longer in vogue, right. you know, how does he sustain himself? And, and you give someone like Muhammad Ali a lot of credit. Yes. Because Muhammad Ali brought him into his inner circle yep. essentially to, to entertain, you know, yep. to be a cool. Yep. Right. But at least it sustained him Same. economically. That's right. mean, how do we get these institutions to think about the thing, that? You know, it's that that's the work that you and I have to do. Um, uh, it's great for us to have, like, so we have people like Ninth Wonder, you have Questlove, you got Nas with the Harvard piece. There are different hip hop artists who have Bun B down, Bun B down in Houston who are right. dipping their toe into the academy. It's a tough thing because Nas can still make a lot more money outside of the academy than he can now. But 30 years from now, um, we want Nas to have made the decision right now about where his papers will be. Where's the reel from the film about Illmatic going to be? Where's right. all the, 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 the... Though we know that's going to Harvard. But. It will. The Nas <laughs> stuff will go to Harvard. But where's Ninth stuff going to go? Um, and again, you know, Ninth can still be extremely successful outside of the academy. So it's a challenge to... To, to say, hey, how do we get you to start thinking about, thinking about this? Yeah, long, long term. And, and, and there's some artist stuff that we've lost. You know, I'm sad that we haven't gotten Cool Herc's papers and his flyers and materials located um, uh, someplace. The, the onus to me is on us as, as scholars to push institutions to do that kind of work. That's what scholars do to get other people's stuff archived. It's challenging, though, because people don't think, particularly of hip hop artists, as being worthy. Uh, of being of being archived, but look, you got Marcelina Morgan up at Harvard with the Harvard Archive. You got the Cornell uh, piece. There are other little things cropping up. They're more general, more broad right now. Um, hopefully, as those sort of spaces Hell, expand. William and Mary has. William and Mary. I mean, come on, like you know, like you know. I, again, that's important work uh, that that we that we've got to do. Any other questions? It does a long time to answer that. One. So, um, so you talked a little bit about making like your works accessible to like the public and but how it has to also be like uh, accepted by the academy. Like, going through like PhD school and stuff like that, how did you make that work? Because I know you just wanted to get your stuff published. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the game for me, and I say this to uh, would-be grasses all the time, is you got to do all their shit first. Do all their stuff first. You know, and especially in fields like English, especially in traditional you know, do all their stuff first. Um, and, and, and sometimes, it's not even about like reading like literature and then you go to hip hop. It's about reading literature and then you might be able to read some black literature. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, you have to do their stuff first. I mean, I'm sorry. No, no, no talk about that for real. I mean, it's only been oh, a generation, oh, really, where like black literature has been accepted, uh, you know, as something that's part of America. Uh, and, and, and to be quite honest, if you look at the English department at Duke in 2015, that might not be the case here. Come on. But, you know, I'm look, just going to look. I did not read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man while I was here at Duke. It's a classic American novel. It so happened to be written by a black guy, but it's been a long time getting women, people of color, people from different backgrounds, <coughs> religious backgrounds, into the American canon. Um, I mean, the North Anthology of African American Literature is only 20 years old. Only 20 years old. And it was a revolution when that piece came out. That was revolutionary that Norton invested that, that much. Um, uh, into it. So I think I think and, and I know that sounds like capitulation to a lot of people. I know it does, but the rules of the game in grad school are pretty ironclad. You know, you got to do their stuff. You, you got to jump through their hoops. You have to pass those exams. You have to uh, write a dissertation that's acceptable to the committee that's there. You have to 
uh, you know, go through the system as, as is. There's some programs that are maybe better than others for that, but I always frame it as do all their stuff first and be good at that stuff. And I, can remember, I remember one time I was uh, in a class, in one of Houston's classes, and um, Sonia Sanchez came to visit the class, and she was like sitting right here, and I was like sitting like right there. And um, she opened up the class by like doing one of her like chant you know, just, she just goes into a trance shit. And if you're sitting next to her, like you can feel her energy. Like I could feel her energy, it was ill, right? And so after that, I was just open to whatever she was gonna say after that. But one of the things she said that was really incredible was, cause there's like all these would-be poets in there. And then someone asked her a question about like, uh, about free verse and all this other stuff. She's like, look, you don't even try free verse until you've written a thousand sonnets. Oh, right. Don't even try like uh, your experimental yeah. poetry um, until you've written your rhyme. You know what I mean? Like, she's there's, broken no, there's no free verse until you know verse. That is the, <laughs> the point. And so while sometimes we think about canons and prescribed bodies of literature or prescribed subject matter in certain fields as being like old or outdated or not diverse enough, they are all those things. Um, but you need to understand the relationship between that material and the material that you think that, that, that you love. And so that's the model for me. Do, do their stuff first, then you'll, you create time and space to do your stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so earlier you were talking about some of the fault lines in the black community that you think Obama's presidency has exposed. Could you talk a little bit about what those are? Yeah, so yeah, I got a track on here that's called Symbolism. Right? And I've tried to break this down in there. And what, basically, and this is a real simple way of saying it, but if you take my dad, who is 85 years old, um, who uh, kind of lived through segregation, uh, lived through civil rights, um, in no way could have imagined living in a moment in America where there would be a black president. For my dad, the symbolism of Barack Obama is all that matters, right? It's an incredible symbolic moment. Um, for everyone in his generation, just seeing Joy Reid on TV, Melissa Harris Perry on TV, Reverend Al on TV, just seeing them on TV, the symbolic nature of it, they're like, we, we, we could not have anticipated. Now, then there's people like me. I'm 43, I'll be 44 in a few weeks. While I didn't expect to see an Obama in my lifetime either, I'm also looking at this and wondering what the substance of his policies are. What, 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 and I understand the politics, study politics, but I want to know like what's the substance of the policy, what's actually happening, what's going on. Um, and I think that is the premier fault line. That there are, and it's not always young, old, split, but it is almost always symbolic substance split. There are many of us who, just like with a Clinton presidency or any other presidency, we want to see the substance of the policies. What, how, to what extent are you resisting the forces of neoliberalism in a globalized geopolitical context, right? Uh, to what extent are you improving the lot of poor people, people of color and women and people of different identities? Um, we want to know what the substance of the policies of any administration are. Um, and for me, I have had to compromise in some ways, and I will concede that because I'm not going to disrespect my dad. Um, I have to appreciate how he sees the symbolic nature of an Obama presidency. I do. And by the way, there are legions behind him, right, who are invested in the symbolic nature of an Obama presidency. And so even though I, it's hard for me to understand that as a tangible, substantive way of thinking about politics, um, I don't want to cross that fault line so much with, with, especially with older folks who've had a different set of experiences than I've had. It's kind of like, um, you know, I, I spoke at the National Underground Railroad Center a couple of weeks back, and the president of that um, is one of the first black Duke grads here, right? Now, his sense of Duke uh, is a very symbolic sense of it. You know what I mean? He, he loves Duke in a way that I will never love it and appreciates it as an institution in ways um, that I never would. I'm not going to sit down with him and tell him all of my critiques of the, of the Duke experience. It doesn't make sense. It's disrespectful in some ways. Because um, I understand where he's coming from. 
um, and, and, and try to understand the experiences that he had here. First of all, his, what he had here is one of the first questions. I can't even tell him about whatever happened to me. It doesn't even make sense. Right? It doesn't even make sense. And he loves Duke. He bleeds Duke. Right? Even though every day of his life here was discriminating against. Every single day. Like blatant discrimination. Not microaggression discrimination. Every day discrimination. From not just from students, even from faculty, staff, whatever. Well, it's funny, it's like when, when Dear White People came out, <laughs> you, you saw those generational That's old right. lines, right? Older folks were like, you ain't going through nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't, you know, you know what I so, so, so that's one of the major fault lines, is that there, there is a tension between the symbolism, the great symbolism of uh, the country's first black president, um, and, and um, the substance of, of what a presidency has to be for progressive-minded people like myself. And that's, you know, where we're butting heads. And to be honest with you, I probably was more on the symbolism side of this early on in the administration. And I've become, like everybody. I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've transferred more to the substantive side of it. Um, you know, only two people who weren't were like Lynn Ford and Sandy Darrett. Yeah, right? they were there early, <laughs> early. Maybe Rosa Clemente, too, since she ran against them. They were there, they were there, they were there early. Um, so, so that that's one fault. There's there's a few others, but that's that's one major. Last question. Um, I have a question for both of you guys about what it's like to be like black faculty at universities with predominantly white colleagues in terms of like, turn, the tape off. turn the tape off. Turn the tape off. Sorry, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, in terms of like uh, getting respect and like explaining what you do in a way that people uh, believe it's intellectual. You, do, you want to go first on that? You do a lot of additional labor. Mm. Invisible. You, you find yourself educating colleagues all the time, mm -hmm. um, and then they become experts. <laughs> <laughs> and then they become experts and create shit at the same institution that they deny you access to. Right. Mm. So, it's, so that's that's one mm. aspect. Of it. Mm. Um, it, it, it's you have. It's almost something that you have to do, right? Because you can't ignore it. Um, it you constantly have to validate why you're here and what you do yeah. um, in ways that very few other faculty have to. Um, yeah. For me, it's also a, a distinctly difference between a private institution, a lead institution like Duke, yeah. and what it was like at a huge public institution mm -hmm. um, where they warehouse students. Mm -hmm. And so if you get anything from those students, Right, you know, folks are like, well, you just do what you do. Um, at some places like Duke or Penn or some place like that, yeah. you know, those aren't the students that you have, right? So folks tend to pay much more attention to, yeah. you know, whether or not, and, and this is the best way to think about it, the concern from the university is whether or not we are defiling the brand. <laughs> right, you know, Duke's not interested in, in, say, the class that many of you are in that ninth and I teach. They are not interested in that being the brand, right? Even if it actually does some significant work for their brand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, one. I think we're both privileged to be able to speak freely about this because we're tenured, and, <laughs> and we have to acknowledge. Talk. We have to acknowledge the fact that when you look at the data on women and black professors in terms of the ranks of tenure at predominantly white institutions, it is a sad and tragic story. It is a sad and tragic story. There is tremendous amounts of discrimination at, in the upper echelons of the academy. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge the fact that we can even speak about this because we are... We, we have some privilege. We have some privilege, have some privilege, to, privilege to, yeah. to do so. Um, so I think it's hard to answer your question for me because it depends on like what battle we're talking about and it also depends on like what my mood is of any one particular <laughs> day. Um, and so generally speaking, I am not as gracious as my dear mentor and colleague here uh, when it comes to educating my colleagues about the plight uh, of black students or of black faculty or the plight of uh, the transgender community or the plight of poor people or any of those things because I feel like people first have to acknowledge what their privilege is, just like I just did, right? If you come to me and acknowledge your privileges as a straight male or as a 
white wealthy person or as a black male or whatever, if you can understand what your privilege is in any one particular situation, I might be able to have a conversation with you. But if we can't start from that point, I honestly feel like you're like a casualty of the culture wars. Like, and just like any casualty on the battlefield, you don't stand there trying to revive them or turn them into a zombie or whatever. You walk over their bodies and you keep moving. Um, and because if you don't, if you don't, what happens is, is you'll end up spending an inordinate amount of time. And so like, there are plenty of people uh, in my department, in the field, who hate that I study hip hop or who think that um, what I study is not worthy uh, of academic inquiry. You know, if I have to prove to one more person that hip hop music is poetry, I'm gonna smack myself. <laughs> Seriously, you know what I mean? It's stupid. I mean, look at it on the printed page. What do you think it is, right? I mean, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. But literally, there are people that you have to like prove that to. To me, they are casualties of the culture wars. Now, if it's a student who is like trying to learn, and again, who is humble and in different settings, I, I will always teach students. But in terms of my colleagues. Just like I gotta read your stuff before right. I had to do mine, right. but maybe you should read it for right. I'm just saying. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thank you all for coming out.